Hey, we found um, each other and we found you again. So we're all live and that is great. And I would like to welcome the Feral Atlas Collective, which is represented today by artist and architect Five Ho Joe and architect and natural sciences Lily Carr. It's really great to have to <laughs> to have you with us. And I personally feel really close to and even a bit envious about the work you have been doing with the Feral Atlas project and now with the Feral Atlas workshops. We'll, um, will you also share some of the impressions from the workshop that ran alongside this festival? Yeah, we will. That is, that is fantastic. So before I hand over to you, I would um, point out that we will do Q&A on Telegram after the session. And um, both of our fantastic speakers will join Telegram after the session for this purpose. So that's really fantastic. Um, and with that said, I would like to hand over to you, Lillian, if you can take it from here. Thank, Thank you. you, Julian. Thank you, Julian, for the introduction. Great to have you. On February 20th, 2015, researcher Kelsey Nagy took a walk following a cow named Shilpa in a Gokhlan neighborhood of Mysore, Karnataka in Southern India. It's a typical day for Shilpa and Kelsey traced her route around the neighborhood, foraging for food and water, strolling on the streets and taking breaks. Kelsey used her phone to record this route that um, Shilpa took, which I've combined her photos to create this map that you're seeing. It shows that Shilpa made, uh, made multiple stops at dumpsters to seek food. Indian cattle provide income for urban farmers and they're seen as sacred in Hindu culture for turning agriculture and uh, human food waste into milk, labor, fertilizer, and uh, other byproducts. Or feeding them waste is considered as normal locally. The scattered plastic bags constituted by polyethylene in urban environments gets consumed by these cows on a daily routine accidentally and release toxic chemicals that enter human bodies through cow meat, milk, and other forms. As polyethylene does not decompose, they stay in our bodies and also can be traced everywhere, even in soils and plants. Here's a selection of Kelsey's photographs she took on her journey. These photos show how plastic bags spread the toxicity through the water, soil and flesh, which are living things that became partners with plastic pollutants and enter the food chain, whether non-humans or humans. In this story, the plastic bags are what we call a feral entity. The way they partner up with other non-human companions in order to emerge, proliferate and spread is what we call their feral qualities. The dumping of waste is, is ubiquitous. Not only plastic bags, dangerous waste is accumulated and distributed by humans in many forms, whether garbage, toxins or radioactivity. The undesired products of our fast advancing society to the ecological world they are the product of the Anthropocene. In Fair Atlas, we call this transformative action dump. Consider it as a verb. Since the mid 20th century, humans has created indestructible toxic waste on a vast scale that could no longer be disintegrated by nature. Fair Atlas collects a number of videos to convey the similar ant anthropogenic actions of dump. For example, look at this um, dump site, a uh, landfill site where garbage was collected and gathered, as well as videos of um, nuclear waste gets um, stacked, as well as um, plastic left outside factories um, and industrial waste such as tiles being left in the wild and um, acid mine drainage that get leaked into streams and rivers. So um, these actions achieved by human-made infrastructure programs that technological apparatus on certain scale. Other than dump, there are many other similar actions that, of infrastructure works that essentially alter the land, air, and waterscape around us and cause the spreading of these in, uh, feral effects. So those verbs, just like dump, are what we call tippers, infrastructure-mediated state changes. They describe the infrastructure processes that radically change environments to the point where our social and ecological systems are tipped from one state to another. We follow the thread of infrastructure works and start to imagine 
this critical error that we're currently in, we call the empathy. To achieve so, after numerous sessions of discussions and research with the rest of the editorial team, I juxtaposed real historical and contemporary landscape modification projects across time, location, and scale together, and drew a series of fantastical illustrations which present these world-making processes together. Look at this drawing that depicts the aftermath of the Great Acceleration, where Earth systems have been radically changed by infrastructure projects. Here we see the dumping of plastic waste, which is the infrastructure host of um, the feral entity plastic bag that we just discussed, as well as infrastructures such as uh, container ships that accidentally introduce um, different species such as com jellies to um, in, in their ballast water to other ecosystems, as well as pharmaceutical companies that has been um, discharging their effluent into our, our rivers and seas, as well as um, pork factories that has been used antibiotics in feeding those um, pigs, as well as radioactivity um, leaked and released from nuclear power plants and many more infrastructures. Behind each infrastructure that you can see with the gray dot hides a feral entity and the first hand re uh, field record. Each illustration shows a world triggered by a particular set of historical conjuncture and together they form the Anthropocene. In Feral Atlas, we call these, um, we call them Anthropocene detonators and this one is named Acceleration. Feral Atlas argues that the human built infrastructures whether industrial or imperial, creates eco ecological effects that develop and spread beyond human control. These undesigned, unexpected and out of control effects are the Anthropocene. The plastic bags is merely one entry of the others. Feral Atlas is a digital humanities experiment in studying and viewing the Anthropocene. It's curated and edited by Anna Singh, Jennifer Diga, Alda Kieleman Saxena, and Faye here, together with a group of researchers and designers, including myself, um, and many other makers who helped us make the Atlas come alive. It was published just a month ago by Stanford University Press and is available here as an open access website. We're seeing, um, as Lily scrolled down, it's just a full list of all of the contributors and collaborators we have in the team. Um, also on this title page, you will see a web page um, covered by traces of virality. Um, these are charcoal and pencil drawings that are made of a combination of disintegrating cells and viruses. If you look closely, they're coronaviruses, not to scale. Whether you're browsing this, while you're browsing on this first page, you enter uh, encounter of Feral Atlas. They're infecting and damaging the digital ecosystem from your screen. So your Feral Atlas journey has begun. So when you land on the site and click enter, um, you will land on this page of jostling feral entities, each of which is studied by one of the 79 reports in the Atlas. So if you mouse over any of them, you'll see which Anthropocene detonator world they belong to. Let's pick Southern Oak Death. Southern Oak Death belongs to the Anthropocene detonator world capital. Um, and here you can find it hiding in um, commercial tree nurseries, which have transported the disease overseas. Capital is a world that sees ecologies as resources for human use, converting land, air, water, organisms, lives and livelihoods into commodities through imperial and industrial programs of factories, inventory warehouses and plantations. And exploring around, ooh, we come across um, an industrial plantation of orange trees. Um, and zooming in, hiding within it, we come across the feral entity of bee villains. Clicking takes us to the tippers page. And this is grid, where the, the infrastructural action of gridding is designed to simplify land and ecologies in an effort to make them more productive and more efficient. Yet the action of grid gives rise to non-designed feral effects, such as the spread of pests and pathogens, species survivors and species survivors that thrive while others are destroyed. Um, 
scrolling down, you come across a very glitchy video <laughs> of a corn harvest um, from Illinois in the United States, which was made by artist Bruce Rhodes, Trevor Birkenholtz and Armin Link. And when you scroll down, um, you will find other videos um, made by these artists and other Feral Atlas contributors that also express the infrastructural action of gridding in different places and scales and manifest um, uh, across different ecologies. And below these, you will find um, a tip of poem, which is written by none other than Feral Atlas editor, Anna Singh. At the bottom of the page, you can either explore some of the other feral entities that have flourished as a consequence of the grid, or you can click forward um, to the field report. Um, and this takes you to a field report um, written by biologist Marcela Sili Santos, who follows bees and farming activity in Anomalia, the fruit producing capital of Colombia. Um, first, we land on a flow map which um, in Feral Atlas we call a map that attempts to express the spatial and temporal dynamics that inform the feral dynamics and activities of bee villains. This is a map that Marcella and I made um, and it shows some of the 70 plus bee species found in Anomalia from Marcella's research. The diversity of sizes, shapes and colors of species depicts the many ways in which bees relate to the vast diversity of flowering plant species blooming there but simplified landscapes and agro-industrial plantations are expanding, creating hostile zones for many insects and driving their declines. Um, so notice how the bees are disappearing. Marcella observed the order of this decline over the course of her field work, and many, um, mostly solitary bees, have disappeared before they've even been identified at the species level. Um, only two survive and flourish you'll have to go onto the Feral Atlas site to see which two. Um, so scrolling down. Um, so when you scroll down and I'm reading the report, you will hear about how the two surviving and flourishing bee species are perceived by local farmers as both aggressive villains that threaten their tranquility and their crops, but also work as essential pollinators in place of lost species. Um, and as with all feral atlas stories, multiple angles from a multitude of perspectives and disciplines and practices are required to tell these stories richly. Um, and if you dive into the materials, the visual materials or um, the hidden materials clicking on feral qualities, um, and also uh, by exploring the poems um, hidden on the site, um, you will kind of come to see all the different contributors and kind of perspectives that have contributed to telling um, the stories in these reports. Um, and at the bottom of each report page, you have a choice. You can either revert at your own risk, which takes you back to the page of jostling feral critters, or you can click on the super index, which you can also get to by clicking on the key anywhere in the site. So let's go there now. So on this page is what we call the super index, which is a master index that shows all the key concepts of Feral Atlas and their associations. So if you mouse over any choice of feral entity, um, the index will give you its corresponding combinations in the atlas, such as which um, Anthropocene detonator belongs to on the top and which tippers it creates on the left and what um, feral entity, feral qualities it holds on the right. Similarly, if you mouse over say invasion, the index will provide all the combinations that belongs to the world of invasion. Be mindful that this is not a fixed set of categorizations. This is only an index of guidance that can be taken beyond. This is why if you look closely, there's another layer of text just kind of floating beneath this super index, which we call the soup. They show other possibilities of terms in the atlas, such as net, tailing, avian flu, and so on and so forth. And if you keep going um, down, Underneath this super index, you'll find overview of all the essays written by contributors, editors, and collaborators. And also, if you go further down, there's a list that displays all the feral entities and the watercolor critters we drew, um, which we call this the chocolate box, quite literally. All of them are displayed in gray, except the ones you visited. And if you see reputations, they are same entries written by different authors. 
we invite you to visit and activate all of them. Um, at any point in the Feral Atlas site, you can click on these three bars at the bottom, which take you to essays written by the Feral Atlas editors, makers, and contributors. Um, and these essays are also held in the reading room. And um, we would like to draw your attention in particular to the teaching section. Um, Feral Atlas is intended as an active tool to think with and work with and to use as a jumping off point for research and further studies. Um, and so these are ideas and exercises and readings, um, reading lists that have been written by the Feral Atlas editorial team and other contributors um, for using Feral Atlas in courses and workshops across disciplines. And Faye and I adapted this section, which is Feral Atlas exercises, connecting the material to the place where you live um, for an online workshop we ran this weekend um, here at Driving the Human earlier today um, and yesterday at the Making Matter Symposium at the Het New Institute in Rotterdam. So Feralis argues that st to study the Anthropocene, we need to follow feral effects. And to follow the feral effects, we need to notice what imperial and industrial infrastructures do. So the workshop was um, an experiment in using Feralis to notice what's around us, um, using Feralis as a verb, which is also the title of our workshops. Um, so the workshop was a prompt um, to everyone who took part to go out and observe the action of tippers, meaning the dumping, burning, gridding, taking, piping, smoothing and speeding and crowding work that infrastructures do, um, which radically transform land, air and water, um, but that we have stopped really noticing. Um, they've become a totally normalized part of our daily lives. So um, we each went out for a coronavirus socially distanced walk um, in the area where we live to try and observe and record and express the actions of infrastructures at work in our local areas. Um, and uh, everyone was invited to use whatever method and material and recording device um, we each felt comfortable using. Um, and here you are looking at the collected recordings from um, the workshops over the past few days. Um, and you can see that there are a lot of photos um, and some videos, um, but there are also sound recordings and poems. And um, I think now we can maybe talk about some of the ones that we really, I mean, they were all amazing. Um, and it was so interesting, actually. I think we both learned so much from doing this. Um, and yeah, Faye and I will show you some of the, um, yeah, contributions. Yeah. Um... So there's this one um, taken by Katharina Suk Welting from the Netherlands. Um, I don't know, yeah, if it was still showing screen. So it's a very simple uh, picture of just a fruit stand, which we can see everywhere. But this picture really triggered us to think about the commerce behind the plantation and shipment of fruits and vegetables, whether they're growing in industrial farms or greenhouses or even labs. So these are all kind of infrastructure work that's kind of created this sort of simplification created by grid. And um, looking at another one created by anne Katrin Gosen um, um, in uh, Germany, um, <clears throat> which is one of kind of um, a picture she took outside this um, botanic garden in construction. But what's quite interesting is um, Botanical gardens, a typical case of taking, you know, taking kind of exotic plants from one place to another or uh, to showcase. So um, in the process of taking the transferring, they're introducing these kind of um, other uh, species that sometimes become invasive to the local ecology. But then if you look closely, there's also wooden palace just kind of um, in the little courtyard. So we're seeing the taking of living things and as well as non-living. So wood in kind of two forms. Um, both the processes are um, in a way transferring these pests and pathogens, fungi, viruses, and so on and so forth. Um, this is quite an interesting one. So this is a photograph of something that's not <coughs> there anymore. Um, and this was taken by Zina Hassan in Copenhagen. And she was telling us how in Copenhagen, they used to use a particular kind of salt to de-ice the roads and pavements um, that they then realized actually was, um, you know, 
containing toxins and um, toxic chemicals, which of course, when the ice melted, uh, ran these chemicals off into surface runoff, um, and then these chemicals enter the ecosystem. So now this particular kind of salt has been banned in Copenhagen. Um, and actually there is another one, which is also kind of trying to capture um, uh, something which we can't see. Um, and so this is, and these are quite beautiful photographs taken by Antea Ostreicher um, in the town where she lives in Germany. And she's a master's student who studies lichens um, and lichens are notorious air pollution sensors. Um, and certain species flourish depending on the levels of pollution in the air. And she was telling us how actually over the course of the pandemic um, and lockdowns, she's noticed that um, certain lichen species that weren't there before have started to flourish, um, which she thinks indicates a possible drop in air pollution. Um, and this is actually a really nice um, one to end on because um, in Feral Atlas we have the fantastic Jennifer Gabris also writing a report about her work with lichens as sensors. So we invite you to go onto the Atlas and explore this too. Um, but yes, this is the collection, the collective work. Oh, wait, maybe I can show one video actually. Sorry. Ah, oh, maybe not. We can take it from here, I think. I just wanted to share one comment from um, the Telegram because it kind of sums up my reaction. It's from Sasha and Sasha says, I really love the Feral Atlas project. Thank you so much for making it happen. So I want to extend that thanks. And also thanks for sharing what happened this weekend um, at this workshop that took place in so many places at once, which is also kind of fantastic and weird. And um, yeah, I happen to work with experimental publications quite a lot. And I just really love the way that you can play with different ways of ordering in the online publication. It's such a rich experiment in storytelling. And um, I think there's 357 people in the Telegram room who are really looking oh, forward to meeting you there for the yeah. <laughs> after session Q&A. So thanks for um, agreeing to join us there. And um, thank you again for this fantastic session.